Well, thanks very much, Joe, for the introduction, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, thanks for waking up bright and early on a Sunday morning on a long weekend. So we certainly appreciate your, uh, your attendance here. Um, so um, the, the bar for keynotes as of last night has been set really high. Um, you need a Nobel Prize and you need some really cool movies. Um, so I think with, with enough of a head notice, I think I could have arranged for a Nobel Prize. But uh, I think Michael and I will try to do the best job uh, as we can in uh, talking about climate change and why climate change is really important and the role that deep learning plays in, in climate change. So um, I'm also going to take you on a grand tour of science. Um, we're going to take problems from cosmology involving simulations of the entire universe, uh, astronomical, astronomical images involving analysis of telescope data from a number of telescopes. Um, uh, we're going to talk about climate science, so Michael is going to help me with that. Um, we'll pick up problems in neuroscience, uh, genomics, and then finally all the way down to subatomic physics. The common thread across all of these use cases is going to be deep learning. So in the last five years, I would say that this is probably the most important development in computer science. Uh, this is a highly successful algorithm that has been applied to industry problems. But today we're going to talk about how deep learning can have an impact on science. That's the, the main theme of the talk. <clears throat> so uh, just the, the outline is going to be the following. Um, uh, from NERSS perspective, where I work, uh, we're going to talk about how the nature of science is changing, why data analysis and machine learning are important going forward. Then uh, we'll briefly touch upon uh, deep learning in the industry. I suspect that all of you are up to speed on this, but we'll have a few obligatory slides, I guess. Um, then uh, Michael's going to help me with the, the uh, case study on climate science, uh, and we'll review four or five other quick case studies in other domain sciences. And then I'll speculate about the road ahead. Uh, you know, are we done? Uh, is it just a matter of finding enough data, turning the crank, and you get great results? Or are there some hard problems remaining? So we're going to do that speculation right at the end. All right, so let's start with how science is changing at NERSC. So for those of you who may not uh, be familiar with NERSC, NERSC is probably the world's most diverse supercomputing center. We have 7,000 different uh, users, 700 different projects, and a truly international uh, set of user base. Uh, in the DOE, we, suppo uh, we support all applied offices from biological and environmental research, high energy physics, uh, nuclear physics, fusion, uh, materials, uh, uh, chemistry, geophysics. Uh, certainly on the computing side of things, applied math is what we are known for. Uh, so a lot of expertise, deep expertise, I would say, in uh, PDE solvers, but also uh, DOE owns the Exascale mission. So NERSC is an important user facility that supports the, the broad uh, workload. Now, NERSC, apart from, you know, in the last 40 years or so, we've done a great job at supporting HPC workloads. And we do have a history of working with experimental and observational data science projects. So we have uh, astronomy projects that range from, say, the Palomar Transient Factory, the DESI instrument, uh, the Planck satellite, uh, all sorts of different flavors of LSE detectors in ATLAS and CMS and so on and so forth. Uh, also strong collaborations with the Joint Genome Institute, where we get a lot of production sequencing data, and we run production pipelines. Uh, light sources in the advanced light source, also the, the SLAC LCLS instrument, uh, and then also neutrino detectors and so on and so forth. So, uh, so we have uh, a history, I would say a successful history of working with uh, experimental observation data. What's, what's different? What's changing? One, uh, increasingly, I think, as we track where the data is coming in to NERSC from, there is a wide proliferation of data sets from all sorts of observational facilities. I listed a few in the last slide, but we see across all applied offices, uh, a lot of people are turning to NERSC in terms of uploading and streaming their data to our machines. The scientific workflows have definitely become more complex. So a place like NERSC is not anymore you know, where you just submit a bad job and hope that it completes in two or three days. Users have an expectation in that they will stream their data near real time to an HPC facility. Uh, there will be interactive access. So again, the batch mode of, of data analysis is really not uh, sustainable, I believe, in the long run. And then they expect a, data, a rich data stack. So it's not about getting your C, C++, and Fortran compilers running. Uh, we do need a contemporary modern data stack to run well on the supercomputer. And another, I think, important trend, associated trend, I would say, is that important scientific problems both require an HPC as well as a data analysis component. And uh, increasingly, folks from the applied offices turn to us and say, we want machine learning and we want statistics to work on your, on your systems. So in the last uh, two or three years that I've been in this role in, uh, at NERSC, I've talked to a lot of people in all the applied offices at, at DOE. So high energy physics, so along, the, along the columns here are various uh, science groups. Uh, so in high energy physics, we might have the astronomy community, cosmology, particle physics folks. 
In the biological and environmental research side, we have folks from climate and genomics. Uh, in, in basic energy sciences, we have folks who run light sources and have materials prompts. In nuclear physics, we have instrumentalists who create uh, heavy ion colliders. Uh, in fusion energy, we have plasma physics simulation folks, also people who work on, on tokamaks of all, all flavors. So when you talk to them and you ask them, what is it that you mean when you want to do data analytics or uh, statistics or machine learning, essentially they, they specify the following. They want to do a, a pattern classification problem, or they have a regression problem. So these are all examples of supervised problems. Or they want to just explore their data set, do clustering or dimensionality reduction. These are unsupervised problems. Uh, increasingly, even though NERSC has a lot of computational resources, uh, people are interested in inexpensive surrogate models. Uh, sometimes folks have design of experiments problems in that maybe they cannot run a comprehensive set of simulations that explore the parameter space. Uh, they just want to choose a few points. So how would you go about choosing a few points in a high dimensional parameter space? Then, of course, feature learning is, is often a prerequisite, I would say, for many of the problems listed above. Uh, but also, just by itself, people want to understand what the interesting features are in a data set. And finally, anomaly detection. In many ways, particle physics, winning the Nobel Prize in particle physics is all about detecting an anomaly and explaining that. So this table essentially captures our requirements in the machine learning statistics uh, space. And towards the end of the talk, I'm going to come back to this table and speculate on what deep learning has been able to accomplish in this table and what does that mean going, going forward. So in order to tackle those challenges listed in the last slide, uh, at NERSC, again, hardware comes naturally to us. Again, uh, close collaborations with, with Intel and Cray and other vendors have enabled us to deploy big systems. So Cori is our, is our flagship system at this point in time. It's a Cray XC40 machine, has over 9,600 uh, nice landing nodes. Um, so if you're a data user, uh, that's a lot of computational horsepower. But fundamentally, you want to get data in and out of the machine. Uh, that, I think, is a primary difference between data and, and HPC. Uh, so we have the Energy Sciences Network, which helps us move data from remote sources to NERSC. Uh, once you get the data to one of our file systems, so you might have something slow like HPSS, but also GPFS and, and Lustre, uh, you might choose to place that data on, on the burst buffer. So that's a 1.5 petabyte sized uh, SSD array that can support IO rates of 1.5 terabytes a second. So that's really important, because again, moving data in and out of the system is the big, big challenge for, for data science. So that's the, the hardware side of things. Now, on the software side, uh, I mean, this is the, the primary role, my, my primary role and my group's primary role in getting this data stack up and running. Uh, again, uh, you know, maybe if you turn the clock back 10 years or so, technologies like Python and R would be frowned upon. You know, maybe they wouldn't consider a part of the HPC ecosystem. But that's not a choice anymore. We have to support a rich stack. So generally at NERSC, when we think about the, the big data strategy in terms of software, the capability areas that we support are data transfer. How do you get your uh, data in and out of the system? So we have tools like Global Grid FTP. Uh, once your data is in place, chances are high that you'll want to sh share your data set with other communities. So we have a range of web portal technologies that we support. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks are a very effective front end for sharing your code and analysis with, uh, with other folks. Workflows are important, so uh, it's not going to be the case that you'll by hand run canned analysis again and again, so workflow technologies are important. Uh, data management is extremely important if you made poor decisions regarding how you store your data in text CSV files. Uh, you're going to be in trouble down the line. So technologies like HDF5, NetCDF root are important. And certainly, uh, scientists use databases uh, all along. So technologies like Postgres, MongoDB, MySQL, SciDB are all uh, part of our ecosystem. Uh, the DOE has a long history of supporting visualization tools in, in Visit and Paraview, so that's what we turn to for scientific visualization. And finally, analytics. Again, in the data stack space, this is where all the buzz is. And this talk is going to fo uh, focus on data analytics and machine learning and deep learning. So, um, uh, so obviously, languages like Python, R, Julia are extremely important. Frameworks like Spark are up and coming, and that's something that we are tracking quite closely. There are a bunch of legacy tools like MATLAB, Mathematica, Fiji that we support. Uh, and, and in deep learning, clearly, there's a lot of flux in the eco ecosystem. So right now, I've just jotted down three technologies, but there are going to be more. There's going to be flux going forward. So I think the purpose of this slide is the following. I mean, you know, you can have one takeaway from this talk in that deep learning will save all of world's problems, will solve all of the world's problems, and that's what we should focus on. 
But data, deep learning is a component of the broader analytics suite, which in turn is a component of the entire data stack. So you have to keep in mind that uh, a scientist is going to be turning to this entire stack to get their workflows going. So um, you know, how does this stack scale? Um, if I look at every single technology in the last slide, um, will everything hold up at large scales? So this is a cartoon that, that I used to pitch the, the big data center to, to Joe and others. In that, let's say if we, if we qualitatively plot the number of data science users on the y-axis, and along the x-axis, we plot how much data they might want to process at what concurrency. So maybe a scientist might want to process a terabyte of data on 1,000 cores. And in this case, I guess we'll, we'll refer to cores as CPU cores, um, 10 terabytes of data on 10,000 cores uh, and, and higher. What technologies will actually hold up? So we at NERSC, we believe that the mode of this distribution is likely going to be at the order of 10 terabytes and data scientists will want to run at order 10,000 cores. That's most likely going to be the, the mode of a distribution. So really, a lot of uh, the effort that we have in our group is around making sure that all technologies work at that scale and below that. But the question essentially I asked myself was, well, what's going to happen on the right side of this curve? When scientists have hundreds of terabytes of data and they want to run at full scale on a, on a supercomputer, are we going to give up and go back to C, C++, assembly, Fortran? Uh, or are we going to try to make an effort to get these contemporary data technologies to scale to the right side? So that's what the big data center is all about. I'm not going to discuss that in detail today. But, uh, but the simple questions we are, gonna, we are asking in the big data center are, what are the capability applications in the data space? Uh, what is going to be a software strategy going forward? And then how do we best utilize HPC hardware? And this is a close collaboration with uh, Joe and, and other members in the Intel team. All right, so moving on to the talk and data analytics, I, I did want to paint a broad caricature of how deep learning fits into data analytics. So one, um, you know, AI is a, is a broad term, means many things to many people. And I would say that in the DOE, we are not quite ready for general purpose AI yet. Uh, the part that we care about is machine learning, and obviously deep learning is a subset of, deep, of, of machine learning. There are many techniques in machine learning, logistic regression, support vector machines, random forests, and so forth that are not what you would call deep learning at this point in time. So deep learning refers to a very specific set of methods that are oriented around neural networks and they involve processing uh, many, many layers of, of such networks. Now, it is important that there are other things in the ecosystem as well. So statistics is important. People do want to be computing baseline statistics. And we have a lot of code bases and users that do that. And that's not going away anytime soon. Uh, there are people who do standard image and signal processing. Last night's keynote on LIGO was a great example of image processing techniques like F FFTs and others being applied at scale. Uh, linear algebra is obviously key to, a many, to many such computations. And finally, there are some specialized folks who care about graph analytics as well. So uh, uh, you know, I, I, in, in a few years, maybe I'll have a version of this plot that, that resize. Things are not to scale here, obviously. Um, I'd like to resize these, these uh, uh, different approaches based on the number of cycles that we are actually using at NERSC. But for the time being, I'll say that deep learning is, is up and coming. By no means is it a major fraction of our production workload. But we do expect that to change going, going forward. All right, so, um, so hopefully that gives you a broad sense for where NERSC is, why machine learning is important. Our users are asking us for it. Uh, we've deployed hardware. We're trying to get the software stack to work. And scaling is, is a key theme uh, going forward. So I'm going to shift to deep learning specifically now. And I'll touch upon deep learning in the industry. Again, I, I expect that you all know this, uh, but just, just in case. Um, um, so clearly, uh, there is a tremendous amount of buzz around deep learning. It's not every day that Google and Microsoft reinvent themselves as AI-first companies. Um, uh, you know, a lot of activity in, in Montreal around many research labs being set up there. Um, Intel, with its Nirvana Systems acquisition, uh, and also other substantial investments has, has stepped up. So uh, there's a lot of buzz, and one might ask the question, why? Is this all hype, or is there actually something real here? Well, clearly, uh, there is something going on. And I would say that as a computer scientist, I've tracked some of these problems for multiple decades. And the kinds of results that we are seeing are truly breakthrough. So in computer vision, the, the problem of finding objects in real-world images, uh, as uh, instantiated in the ImageNet, work, uh, in the ImageNet challenge, um, deep learning-based systems are now exceeding human-level performance in finding such objects. The same story for speech recognition. For three decades, 
researchers at Microsoft and, and uh, Google and other places have tried to beat human level speech recognition performance. And now, sure enough, deep learning based systems can, can do better than humans in, uh, in recognizing and transcribing speech. In control systems, self driving cars are not, a sci not science fiction anymore. Uh, in, in California, at least, uh, we have Google cars and, and, and other variants um, uh, uh, you know, running on, on, uh, on highways. It's happening. And finally, um, you know, every generation has a, has a moment where um, the, the human expert gets beaten. Uh, Gary Kasparov was comprehensively defeated by, by Deep Blue a few years back. In our generation, uh, the game of Go, which is supposed to be exponentially harder than chess, was again comprehensively defeated by the AlphaGo system. And now there is a version of the AlphaGo system called AlphaGo Zero that uh, has essentially defeated AlphaGo uh, 100 to 0. So anyway, so remarkable progress, really. Um, so there is, there is something here that's, uh, that's worth noting. So around four years ago, I, I saw this trend and I asked myself the very simple question, uh, can deep learning work for science? Uh, given that these very hard problems in computer science, in computer vision, in speech recognition, in robotics, in control systems, uh, are suddenly uh, uh, you know, being solved, can, can, uh, can we get this, can we apply this technology to science? So there are some similarities, clearly. Uh, the tasks that I'd outlined in this table uh, around pattern classification, regression, feature learning, uh, clustering, we care about those tasks in science. And those are the kinds of tasks that deep learning has been applied to in the industry. But there are some differences as well. So in particular, the scientific data that we deal with is, is unique. There are some unique attributes. We typically have many more than just RGB, 8-bit RGB channels. Um, we have multivariate data, as you'll see in climate. Uh, the precision that we have corresponding to these channels is fairly high. So we have typically single precision or double precision quantities. That's uh, quite native, I would say, to HPC simulations. The kinds of noise that you have or the kind of structural artifacts that you have in any real-world instrument, they are different from a commodity camera. And then finally, I think uh, from a statistics perspective, um, the, the underlying statistics are likely different of our data sets in science. If you, think, you can think about it simply this way. Um, if you take a commodity camera and you go around clicking images of the natural world, a megapixel camera essentially gives you an image that's in a million dimensional space. So as you go around collecting images, slowly you're going to be populating parts of this million dimensional space. And the deep learning system's job will be to essentially learn classifiers or separating hyperplanes in this million dimensional space. So obviously images of dogs, cats, indoor scenes, outdoor scenes, uh, they're going to have a certain distribution in this space. Now compare that to a fluid flow simulation. Uh, again, our grids have million dimensional points, uh, a million points essentially. Uh, so as you look at multiple time steps and how they line up in this space, chances are high that the data distribution is going to be quite different. So as a piece of statistical device, the question really is, can deep learning learn this underlying distribution and learn classifiers in that, in that space? And uh, some of the slides that we're going to show next essentially show that this can be done for, for scientific data. All right, so we're going to shift to deep learning for science now. And um, uh, we're going to have a few highlights. So we, we're not going to have time to comprehensively cover a lot of uh, domain science areas. But the one deep dive that we will consider is, is in climate science. So I do want to invite my good friend, uh, Michael Weiner, to come up to the stage and uh, chat about climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhat. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about climate science. And uh, my uh, particular interest is in extreme weather and how it will change as, as the climate warms, because that's where uh, all the impacts, all the big impacts are, as we just recently uh, painfully learned from uh, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And in fact, uh, the picture of a hurricane there on the upper uh, left is Hurricane Katrina. There are other kinds of extreme weather that are interesting. Um, in the, uh, below that is what's called an atmospheric river. The forecasters might call that a pineapple express as if it comes over uh, Hawaii. Those are important for the western coast of the uh, United States. In the upper right is an, what we call an extratropical cyclone. It's a much larger system than a hurricane. Um, they can happen also in the winter or summer, bringing uh, uh, copious amounts of rain. And then the one in the, um, in the lower right corner is a, a frontal system. This is a cold frontal system. Um, those are particularly interesting, which, and I'll go into that in a minute. So um, I got into the climate change business as a career change about 25 years ago. 
And uh, one of my mentors, Professor Machoso at UCLA, was, w w and I were discussing how where we were going, and he said to me at that time, well, we have these big computers, and at that time, that was, we had 128 cores, and, um, which seemed like a lot. And, um, and he said, well, you know, someday we'll actually be able to do regional modeling at the global scale. And by that, we meant uh, rather high resolution modeling. And that day has finally come, and uh, this next uh, uh, movie will show a result um, uh, from a 25 kilometer global model. Um, uh, this is a view that an astronaut would see if he could see, he or she could see uh, uh, water vapor through, integrated through the vertical uh, columns of the, of the uh, atmosphere. And what you see in there are, every once in a while you see a hurricane pop up and there's all these atmospheric rivers going in and if you could carefully you'll see frontal systems and, uh, and extratropical cyclones. This is truly a remarkable advance. Um, these are not the models we used in these assessment reports that Joe talked about. These are the state of the art. Now, the model on top, this is now the, the bottom is the 25 kilometer model. The model on the top is the same, same uh, code run at 200 kilometers. And um, on, this t on this screen, which is probably the best this movie's ever been shown on, um, you can really see the differences. Um, by and large, the large scale structure in 200 kilometers is the same as in 25 kilometers. That's good, that means everything we said in the IPCC and national assessment reports at the large scales is indeed not, uh, not gonna change with the advent of these high resolution models. But the, the high resolution model gives us a tool to look at these extreme weather events in a much more confident and credible way. So what's the big computational challenge here, and it's identifying real weather systems. Now, real storms happen in real time, and so humans can keep up with characterizing these storms, and forecasters do this every day, and they do a fantastic job. But simulated storms in a climate model are gonna happen hundreds to hopefully 10,000 times faster than real time. So, um, you know, basically, you know, two guys in a fast computer generated Four, ter four petabytes of data in a couple of years. And you know, going through that by hand is essentially impossible. And so only machines can find these storms. Um, I'll quote Agent Smith from The Matrix, who said, never send a human to do a machine's job. And, and this is indeed one of those cases. And so some storm types can be found without machine learning, like, like hurricanes. Um, they're such a large disturbance to the system, we can, we can develop heuristic methods to find those. And they're pretty good for finding uh, storms better than category three on the Saffir Simpson scale. But some storm types, and that's why I put that frontal system on it, can only be found by hand. And in fact, we do have a database only over the United States that was formed by uh, people at NOAA that took five person years to do the 1950 to, to um, to present day record on the, real, on the real world. So that gives us a data set, but we have no algorithms that based on the properties of frontal systems that we can employ. And so that's where machine, machine uh, uh, learning comes into play. And so you know, why do we want to do this? Well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, we want to compare the present to the past to, to learn whether or not the climate has already changed, but more importantly, what's going to happen in the future. We also can use this information to validate the models, which increases our confidence in projection. And I think this is where I turn it back to you. Sure, sounds good. All there right. Go. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. So if I had to draw an analog between what we do in computer vision and what we want to do in climate science, you know, this picture captures it all. Um, in the pattern classification formulation of the problem, uh, you know, you have an image and you want to say whether there's a cat in the image or not. In this case, we have a more societally meaningful problem, which is, you know, is there a tropical cyclone in this image or not? Uh, in, the, in the localization version of the problem, you want to draw a tight bounding box around the object because in a global map, different storms may be located in different places. Finally, in any, any global image, uh, there might be a number of different patterns. So you want to locate the pattern, draw bounding boxes, and there might be many of them. So that's the general object detection problem. And the segmentation problem is give me the exact pixels corresponding to uh, the, the various storm systems. So um, the next few slides will essentially go into how we've been able to solve number one through three, and then results for segmentation are, are in development right now, which are looking quite, quite promising. So for the, for the very first binary classification problem, which is given a spatiotemporal patch, 
does this contain a storm or not, yes or no. Uh, we've developed Alex Knight-like architectures. There's a bunch of uh, convolution and pooling layers, uh, followed by a fully connected layer, and all that the network is trying to do is to do a binary classification task. And sure enough, uh, if you train a separate network on tropical cyclones, extropical cyclones, uh, I'm sorry, atmospheric rivers and weather fronts, uh, you can get state-of-the-art results with convolution nets. And the, the table essentially lists accuracy numbers for con nets compared to other baseline machine learning methods. So a few observations. One, all of the numbers are fairly high. Actually, they're all 85% and higher. So to me, at least that tells that um, uh, the climate science community has really not explored machine learning very extensively. Uh, second, con nets are doing, are, are doing great across the board. So I think there's a lot of potential promise in using deep learning. Uh, for looking at all kinds of weather patterns. Which leads us to the second architecture, which is, uh, you know, instead of training a separate network for every single weather event, similar to ImageNet, what you want to do is to train one unified network that can learn all sorts of known patterns, but then also potentially discover new patterns. So this is the semi-supervised version of the problem. Uh, essentially, a, a single network, what it's going to try to do is from left to right, minimize a reconstruction error, so given in an input image, it's going to do some filtering on it, pass it through a bottleneck layer, and then deconvolve it or upsample it in some sense, and produce a raw frame. And the network is going to try to make sure that the output reconstruction is as close as possible to the input field. But aside from that, simultaneously, what the network will try to do is off the, the bottleneck layer, it will try to predict known patterns, so known tropical cyclones, known weather fronts, known atmospheric rivers, and their bounding boxes. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, it's it's uh, in, an interesting challenge to get these networks to converge. But we can, we can do it. So, um, so the, the slide essentially shows some reconstruction results. So on the left side, uh, left panel, there are 16 raw input fields from the Camp 5 movie that Michael just showed you. And on the right side, we have reconstructions as produced by the network. So that's looking promising. It, it, does, it does succeed in producing spatial patterns. But this is what we're really after, which is, uh, can I ask the network to uh, locate uh, different storms? So, uh, so in, um, in green is the ground truth, uh, hand-labeled ground truth, and in red is what the network is predicting. So in general, uh, you know, a single network can capture tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers and extropical cyclones. And spatially, it's able to localize them. Uh, the bounding box sizes aren't quite right, and we know that uh, that's a challenge with our current, current implementation, but that's something that we are working on. One exciting development associated with the semi-supervised network is that apart from solving an interesting science problem, uh, we actually used it as, as a real science driver for scaling this out. So our big accomplishment this year, along with our colleagues at Intel and Stanford, is that we were able to successfully scale deep learning to 15 petaflops, all 9,600 nodes of Cori Phase II system. And uh, there were a few innovations, I would say, on the parameter update side of things. So synchronous parameter updates can only take you so far. And uh, asynchrony uh, prevents, you, prevents the network from convergence. So you have to come up with a hybrid scheme for balancing asynchrony in, in the system. And uh, we get some fairly reasonable uh, weak scaling plots. Uh, if you were not able to catch Narayanan Sundaram's presentation yesterday, uh, we are kicking off the SE17 technical program on Tuesday morning uh, with this presentation. So uh, Nathathur Satish and Thorsten Kors from NERSC uh, will be giving this presentation. So please do check it out. So I want to turn it back to Michael briefly to comment on what these results mean. Yes. And... So where are we now? Um, I think, as the movie showed, only the high-resolution models, so these are things less than 25 kilometers and how they divide up the planet, um, can reproduce the extreme um, storms. But this makes it an even bigger data problem because not only is it much larger spatially, now we're interested in the high-frequency data, so data every three hours is what we use instead of, say, monthly or, or daily uh, simulated output. And so one of the conclusions, this, this picture here represents 75 million hours on, uh, on Cori, and it's a comparison of, of the, the distribution of hurricanes by the category of, uh, category zero, that's a tropical storm, through category four and five, which are the intense hurricanes. And we conclude from this globally that the intense hurricanes become more frequent and more intense in a one and a half and indeed two degree warmer than pre-industrial world, which is about a half or one degree warmer than it is now compared to uh, the, uh, um, 
the, the, the present. And um, a, a tantalizing result is also that it's sort of good news, bad news, I guess. There, there are fewer, weaker storms, but they're, of course, not, that's not where the big damages are. And so if you look at the, you know, with the one with the, the five under it, you'll see that the warmer world has more. So what else could we do with machine learning? Well, as, as I said, you know, we don't have an algorithm any other way, really, to, to find the frontal systems. We can't do it by human, as Agent Smith told us. And so we have to use the, the, the machine learning for that. And that's the next, next real task we have in front of us. But um, um, can we, you know, what are we missing? I mean, can we, are there other kinds of ways of, of, of categorizing storms, um, even in the observations that, that you know, we, we haven't been able to do um, ourselves? One of the things we did find is, is, is as Prabhat mentioned in industry, the machine learning is better than humans. This is also true um, in what we've just shown you, that, that, that uh, uh, the, uh, the machine learning algorithm outperforms the, the human-based data sets. And so can we, can we find structural changes in storms as the climate warms? And these are sort of interesting uh, tidbits that uh, could uh, easily have uh, impacts um, on uh, human and ecological systems. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Michael. Thank you for that. All right, so I'm gonna switch tracks at this point and just walk you through uh, some slides on other science use cases. Um, so, um, so in cosmology, uh, one of the problems that we care about are finding the fundamental constants. Uh, yesterday's LIGO's presentation touched briefly upon maybe how that analysis could get better estimates for the Hubble constant. Um, in this case, um, there are a few approaches one can, one can take on. I'll get to the AI stuff in a second, but I want to call out uh, just conceptually how one might approach this problem. Uh, so again, 10 numbers characterize modern cosmology. Uh, what computational cosmologists do is to plug in those numbers and run a simulation for 16.7 billion years. Uh, then they stop at present day. Uh, and then what they want to do is, well, you know, I have a box with some dark matter particles in it. How do I compare those dark matter particles to what we see in the universe? Uh, it's not quite that easy to do that comparison. So essentially what they do is to compute summary statistics. They run clustering algorithms or two-point or three-point correlations on these boxes, and they run that for observation data. If the numbers match up, hopefully you did a good job in setting your constants. So um, uh, again, it's fairly straightforward now to run trillion particle simulations, and it's, it, that is routinely done on, on uh, uh, DOE supercomputers. But if you have a trillion particles, can you actually do clustering? Um, so again, this is a joint project with, with Intel, wherein we took the DB scan algorithm and applied to a large hack data set. And uh, using some highly optimized uh, distributed KD tree implementations, we were able to complete this clustering in, in 20 minutes on 100,000 cores. Recently, uh, and this is a paper that's also coming up in, in SC, uh, it'll be presented by Brian Friesen and um, Narayanan uh, from Intel uh, on, on Tuesday. Uh, we've taken the expensive order n cube three-point correlation algorithm, and we've come up with a new spherical harmonic-based order n squared approximation method that's able to successfully compute the three-point correlation for the largest data set that we could get our hands on, which is a two billion galaxy uh, data set from the outer rim simulation at Argonne. And then we ran this on, in 15 minutes. So this was a problem that was not possible before, because it's totally computationally inexpensive, but now it can run in 15 minutes on, uh, on Cori. So this is one way of getting at cosmological constants. But uh, someone from Berkeley Lab and CMU had the great idea of essentially framing this as a regression problem. You take a big cosmological simulation data set and uh, ask the, the network to predict the constants. So you want to regress or, or, uh, the constants. So sure enough, again, at DOE, we have access to a larger, lot of cosmological simulations. We knew exactly what constants went into the simulation in the beginning. We train a 3D convolutional network. And uh, lo and behold, we find that, yes, indeed, for two of the 10 constants, uh, you can actually solve this regression problem. Uh, interestingly enough, it turns out that the scientists in this project are computationally bound right now. So they know that they want to extend this network out. They want to make it predict other eight constants but they just need enough access to enough computational horsepower. So this is going to be a, a topic for further investigation uh, on Cori going forward. Now, not just that, but we've also found that you can train something called a gener generative adversarial network on the output of such cosmology simulations. And essentially, I think what we found is that a GAN can learn higher order statistics uh, in cosmology mass maps and can synthetically produce 
uh, other data sets, virtual data sets, that have the right statistics. So uh, on the bottom right, uh, essentially you see a power spectra of, um, uh, of, of various modes um, in, in observed data sets and also in GAN output. And those seem to line up really well. So it's, it's an intriguing uh, observation in that can GANs, suitably trained GANs, potentially replace expensive cosmological simulations. So moving on to uh, astronomy, um, and again, this is one of my favorite projects, uh, which is to take all telescope data in the world and to infer one unified catalog of all objects in the sky, all stars, all galaxies, and to come up with point estimates, but also come up with uncertainty estimates, which can then be used by scientists to determine their telescope pointing strategy. So, um, uh, so again, before we get to the AI, the conventional approach is to come up with a graphical model. So this is probably uh, the largest graphical model that exists in science. Uh, along with the physicists and some very talented statisticians, we've come up with a model that captures all the interesting properties of a star that you might care about, how they might relate to each other, and then how that might result in a certain photon count in your CCD sensor. Uh, you essentially use Bayes' rule, given that you have CCD photon counts, you use the Bayes' rule to invert, um, uh, essentially do the inference, and come up with estimates for the parameters that you care about regarding stars or galaxies. So the Celeste project, and again, Ken Fisher from Julia Computing presented this yesterday, uh, showed as to how we've been able to solve this problem at scale, uh, solved simultaneously for 8 billion parameters corresponding to 188 million stars and galaxies. But the most interesting part is that all of this is written in Julia. So uh, I guess a newcomer relatively, uh, but uh, this is the first app, Julia application to exceed 1.5 petaflops in running this statistical inference algorithm at scale. So um, it turned out that as we, as we worked on this, this project, the box corresponding to galaxies was not quite working well. So we tried to come up with a parametric uh, representation for galaxies using mixture of Gaussians, uh, but galaxies just turn out to be very hard to model. So the, the images that you see here show the visual complexity in, uh, in the appearance of galaxies. So this is where deep learning comes in. And uh, again, the statistician replaced the parametric approach with something called a variational autoencoder, uh, which essentially learns uh, a, a low dimensional mapping uh, of galaxies. And then in the Celeste model, we've now replaced uh, the, the mixture of Gaussians with this autoencoder, and we seem to be getting better results. So uh, for me, I think there's one important takeaway, which is sometimes people get all worked up about, oh, is deep learning going to replace conventional statistics, and what if I have a, a generative model or a first principles understanding of my physical system? Uh, do I need to give all of that up and use deep learning? Not really. So if you have a generative model for your, for your uh, instrument that you care about, uh, deep learning can be a box that you just plug in, and it does a good job at representing a function or a density model or what have you. Uh, so I, I, going forward, I view these approaches as being complementary. They don't have to be one at, at the cost of the other. All right, so moving on to neuroscience. Again, the, the Obama Brain Initiative has uh, channeled a lot of money into the system on developing new sensor technologies. Uh, in this case, the target application that we care about is, is creating the Stephen Hawking device. So you might have a unique individual who uh, has a uh, has an active brain, but is not able to control his uh, motor senses or uh, does not have motor control anymore. So in this case, uh, what we're trying to do is to read off uh, spike train data from electrodes that have been placed in, in the brain, uh, the part of the brain that's responsible for speech planning. So essentially, you see an electrode uh, grid um, on, on the left. And then on the right, essentially, are, are waveforms uh, corresponding to all of those channels um, as a person speaks. So essentially, we perform surgery on a, on a patient, insert this chip, and then have them read Alice in Wonderland for 30 minutes. Uh, so you have input, which is spike train data, and output, which is the speech that, uh, that the person uh, vocalizes. And it's up to the deep net now to learn a mapping between input and output. So sure enough, compared to linear models that have been used in the field for a while, um, deep nets can do a better job at predicting syllables uh, across various subjects. What's more interesting, I would say, about this, this application is the kinds of errors that the deep net makes. So again, interpretability of deep learning is a, is a big challenge. And one of the things that you can, one of the approaches you can try to do is to see when, when does deep learning make mistakes. So it turns out that when you look at the error matrix for um, the predicted syllables versus the ground truth, and just do some very simple hierarchical clustering on, on that error matrix, 
the, the structure of errors that you recover exactly corresponds to how speech is, is uh, produced in, in your mouth. So there might be a few syllables that require you to touch your lips, and uh, sure enough, deep learning has a harder time in distinguishing between those two syllables compared to others. So, um, so in some ways, uh, deep learning has done a good job in modeling the underlying density distribution for speech production. Only English so far, and it's all trained on single subjects. So the models which are being learned are subject specific. Uh, so our, our goal is to try to come up with a, a unified model that can work across all English speakers. And obviously taking the structure of the English language into account will improve the predictive accuracy even more. Moving on to genomics, uh, again, Illumina sequencers are, are used as a production workhorse in facilities like the Joint Genome Institute. But there are new technologies on the horizon, something called the Oxford Nanopore device, which in contrast to Illumina can read off tens of thousands of base pair long uh, reads. The challenge here being that the, the waveforms that you get are really noisy. So if you look at the figure on the, uh, the bottom right, uh, you, you get a certain waveform. And the challenge essentially that you have for deep learning algorithm is taking that waveform and then predicting a sequence of ATCGs. So this is what is called a sequence to sequence mapping problem. The input is a sequence of waveforms, uh, electrical voltages, and you want to predict a sequence of ATCG. So sure enough, um, LSTM models, which have been used for speech uh, translation uh, by Google uh, and speech recognition as well, can be applied to this problem. And uh, we do now get state-of-the-art accuracy in applying these models uh, for the Oxford Nanopore. The, the neat thing about uh, the Oxford Nanopore device is similar to the Modivius uh, stick. Uh, you can bake in this LSTM model on the device and do your decoding on the fly. So it's a really interesting use case, uh, scientific use case. Um, then uh, finally, on to, on high, uh, moving on to high energy physics. Um, again, uh, the high energy physics community is just wonderful at coming up with all sorts of devices that can produce a petabyte a second. And uh, the challenge is, is how do you do analysis in real time? Uh, so right now, there are pattern detection codes that are implemented in FPGAs on the LSC calorimeter that uh, in situ reduce the data volume by six orders of magnitude. Uh, and what we're trying to investigate is here is how maybe deep learning could do a better job at implementing such pattern detection logic. So we operate on the raw calorimeter data. So the, the top right figure is just a visual depiction of, of various patterns. And uh, thankfully, in, in the particle physics community, uh, folks use simulators all the time. So they use Giant 4 and we can exactly control what particle goes into the Giant 4 device, and we have uh, a handle on the output. So we can train our networks on essentially this input-output pair uh, as exercised through Giant 4, and then apply it to held out data. So the, the, the figure on the bottom left essentially shows the, uh, the convolutional architecture that we used for, uh, for this LHC classification problem. And the figure on the bottom right shows the ROC curve for this particular problem. So the dot in the middle there is what physicists have been using for the last decade, uh, which is a hand-tuned uh, cut based on, on variables that the physicists knew how to combine. But again, sure enough, deep learning can beat that state of the art pretty easily. Now, uh, similar to the cosmology simulation problem, um, running uh, Giant 4 is expensive, uh, even at places like NERSC. Uh, so one of the investigations that we have conducted now is, is on developing CaloGAN, so a calorimeter GAN, training a generative adversarial network, in this case a three layer, uh, we are training it on three layers of, of the GAN. Um, um, and essentially, again, you know exactly what input is going in. Uh, you know the output as produced through Giant 4, and you expect the GAN to essentially capture this, uh, this model. Um, both for parameter interpolation studies uh, and to some extent for extrapolation studies, the statistics that you get from the GAN output uh, match up with the real simulations. So again, it's an interesting uh, line of investigation going forward on to what extent GANs can replace expensive simulations. All right, so um, we've gone through about five case studies, and you know I could have talked about five more involving case studies from neutrino physics and uh, some other case studies from astronomy and so on and so forth, but what does this really mean for science? Again, you, you hear about all these 10 different things, what, do we, what can we say about the broader picture? So I want to come back to this, this requirements um, table, which captured what our scientists are looking for in the DOE. I think what I have personally convinced myself is, is the following, that if you have enough training data, 
and it is a big if, but if you do, then deep learning will likely be able to solve your classification and regression problems. I think all the results that we have so far seem to indicate that. And almost certainly feature learning, which is this bottom row here, uh, you know, I think we've had fairly naive notions that humans can design features, and this has been proved to be conclusively wrong in the computer vision community. Similarly, I think in science, um, I think it's clear that feature learning is best left to deep learning. Now, regarding the unsupervised challenges of clustering and dimensionality reduction, uh, I, I think the jury is still out. It's not yet uh, settled as to whether deep learning is the best way to go, but some of the results certainly look promising. Now, finally, for surrogate models, all of the work in, in GANs is really intriguing for us, so that's something that we continue to push forward with. Uh, but also design of experiments in that if you have a, a large parameter space you want to explore and you want to incrementally uh, step through the parameter space, uh, techniques like reinforcement learning can almost certainly be applied here, and I didn't have a chance to talk about that today. So I do want to speculate about you know, what the challenges are going forward if we are done and we can just you know, call it a day, uh, or are there some, some hard problems going forward. So, so I, I have sort of bucketed challenges in, in two flavors. So one is short-term challenges, uh, which I believe can be addressed in the next few years. And the short-term challenges are around handling complex scientific data. So again, images, you know, three-channel images are fairly straightforward, but scientific images are 2D, 3D, 4D. There are many, many more channels in scientific images. The data can be dense, the data can be sparse. And sometimes uh, the data may not be in the format of an image at all. It might be a graph that you need to natively operate on. So making sure that deep learning can natively operate on different kinds of data is really important. Hyperparameter optimization is really important. So again, if you're a biologist or a chemist, you, maybe you're not inclined to become an expert in deep learning or all of the different architectures. So somehow we, I think as engineers, need to provide a canned solution to scientists wherein different networks can be effectively explored. Performance and scaling is, is a challenge, and I think that is something which we in this room probably are really well addressed to take on. Right now, empirically, when we try to train networks on tens of gigabytes of data, it does take us a few days on, on a few nodes. But we already, you know, Michael talked about petabyte-sized data sets. Cosmology has similarly large data sets. Uh, we have to be able to get uh, single node performance, and we have to be able to get multi-node scaling. And some of the, the 15 petaflop results and so on are, are a step in that, that direction. Label data is scarce. We, we just don't have millions of labeled images in science. So operating in that regime is, is going to be a challenge. So somehow I do believe that uh, either we up our ante in the semi-supervised learning space, or we have the domain science communities uh, create labeled data sets. I think that's, that's, that's going to have to happen going forward. So, so this slide, I think, uh, was on what I would say are more engineering-oriented challenge. But there are some core issues going forward. And I believe that if we do not address these issues, I don't, I don't think that domain science communities are going to adopt deep learning wholeheartedly. So one is around lack of theory. Um, again, science cares deeply about theory. And right now, there is very little theory in deep learning around what the fundamental limits are of unsupervised learning, supervised learning, or semi-supervised learning. Just throwing more data at the problem is, is not, uh, not great. Interpretability is important. So again, scientists are not comfortable with black boxes. Essentially, I think the proposition that myself and others are offering to the community is, you know, throw away your two or three decades worth of heuristics and replace it by a perfect black box. And that's, uh, that's not a comforting thought, I think, to some, some domain science communities. So generally, I think there are two approaches to that. One is to develop more introspection tools. So if a network is trained and is doing a great job at, at solving a certain problem, Developing visualization tools or introspection tools to better represent what features are being learned is important. But better still, uh, we should try to bake in physics into these networks. So if you're looking at a fluid simulation data set, we've known the laws of fluid flow for millennia. We know the laws of conservation of mass, momentum, so on and so forth. Surely we should be able to bake that knowledge in instead of you know, hoping the network to maybe pick it up. Um, and I believe that if, you know, if you're going to entertain any thoughts of having GANs uh, be a replacement for simulations, then uh, we need to make sure that our solutions are, are physically consistent. Uncertainty quantification is something that's central to science. The measurement is as important as the error bar around it. Uh, and uh, we need to think about how to handle uncertainty quantification in deep learning overall. Finally, um, uh, we do need a formal protocol, I believe, for, for deep learning. So right now, if you look at applied mathematicians and how they approach computation modeling, 
uh, if there is a natural phenomena they want to understand or model computationally, uh, they think about the underlying dynamics, they think about the underlying PDs, they come up with schemes to discretize the, the, uh, the system, uh, they have uh, ideas about whether some PDs are going to converge versus not. Uh, based on a certain discretization, they know whether what, what scale of uh, in, in both space and time uh, they're going to be able to resolve features, and there'll be subgrade scale phenomena that they're not going to be able to resolve. And then they go ahead and implement the scheme, and then they paralyze it, optimize it. In deep learning, there is just no such protocol, right? It's uh, somehow you get data, and then you turn the crank and hope that, that it all works out. So we will have to be more systematic, I, I believe, going forward. Uh, for a given uh, data set that you're trying to analyze, uh, what is the right architecture? How much training data do I really need? What the generalization limits are going to be of this problem? And then what the uncertainty bounds are going to be on the prediction? I think we'll need to think about that systematically. All right, so a few speculations, I think, uh, going forward. I, I do believe that in the next few years, uh, deep learning tools are going to be broadly deployed. It's already happening in the cloud. Uh, it's already being done at places like NERSC. Uh, I, I do believe that once scientists understand and appreciate that uh, supervised classification and regression problems are solvable, then they will start self-organizing and they will conduct labeling campaigns. And it's starting to happen in climate right now. I do believe there's a lot of low-hanging fruit right now. I think it's fairly straightforward to uh, somehow get a bunch of data, apply a simple AlexNet light architecture, get a new state of the art, and write the paper. And that's going to happen. Um, but going forward, I think it's more fun to, I guess, speculate a little further out. Um, we believe that uh, entire data archives can be segmented and they can be classified. And for me, I don't think that's the end goal. I think, I mean, it's an interesting goal to aim for in its own right. But I believe that downstream analysis, such as anomaly detection, correlation analysis, maybe even causal analysis, becomes more interesting. You get to conduct this analysis in the context of semantic entries as opposed to discrete grid, point, grid points. Uh, with hopefully support and funding from the industry and, and other federal institutions, uh, it's possible that some of these long-term challenges are going to be formulated and addressed. So better understanding of generalization limits, uncertainty quantification, incorporating physics, physics uh, or other domain science principles into such models will happen. So I think the, the slide I want to leave you with is in this context, suppose all of this happens, what is the value add of the scientist? Do we still have a, have, a, have a role as a scientist? What does the scientist really do? So we think that uh, the, the workflow for data science is going to look something like the following in the future. You'll have a big system like Cori or other systems in, in other HPC facilities. You'll have observation data. You'll have simulation archives. And they're all going to be segmented and classified. And you'll have a sentient AI system that knows very, very well how to do that. So such a system can easily present to the human or the data scientist patterns or clusters or maybe anomalies. And now what does the human do? What does the scientist do? So I do believe that they will, the human will provide the semantic labels. Again, semantic labels are an artifact of human language and convention. So that is, that is something that the human will do. I do believe that there will still be room for interactive exploration. We believe that that will happen. But I actually think that more interestingly, scientists will be freed up to think about mechanisms and hypotheses more deeply. Uh, so far, I, you know, as we, as we look at various projects at NERSC, just the drudgery of moving data in and out and staging it and analyzing it and scaling your codes and so on and so forth, that whole cycle takes years sometimes. Uh, so the scientist really has, has to handle that, that entire workflow. If that uh, workflow can be relieved or, uh, or in some ways AI can assist uh, handling the, the analysis, then I believe that the scientists will think deeper about what the data is really telling me. What do these patterns really mean? What is the right hypothesis to, to pursue here? All right, so to conclude, um, machine learning is an important emerging requirement in the community. I think Joe framed this, uh, well, asked me to think about, you know, why do we care about this? Well, the reason we care about this is because we at NERSC as a user facility uh, have a lot of users asking us about this, and we see this trend coming. Uh, so NERSC has invested in, in hardware, in software, in staff. Uh, the big data center is explicitly looking at capability applications in, in the deep learning space. Uh, deep learning has enabled a number of genuine breakthroughs, I believe, in the industry. And I believe there are direct analogs to problems in, in DOE and probably in other domain sciences areas as well. The early successes that we're reporting here are all, I think you'll see a trend here, are by communities that are computationally savvy. They have simulators. They can easily produce training data 
or they've thought about pattern detection. But I believe that there is a broader class of applications and communities that can benefit going forward. So there is certainly, I think, a lot, a lot of low-hanging fruit that can be exploited in the next few years. But there are long-term challenges that exist, and I do believe that we'll have to address those. Finally, I was, I was going to say that you know, it's, uh, it's really not often that uh, you see so much enthusiasm and excitement in the community. Uh, the NIPS uh, call for papers that came out this year, and uh, when the call for registrations came out, uh, in two days, the entire conference was sold out. I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. Um, every other week, there is a new deep learning framework that's, uh, that's proposed. Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. Um, I think the entire community is, is very open in sharing their code and sharing their architectures. I think that's, that's wonderful. Uh, and finally, I think all of the, the great applications, I think, that are coming about, I, I believe it's just the tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think, excitement going forward. So I, I think it's, it's a great time to be a computer scientist. Thanks very much.